The 80s era of animation featured some of the most iconic and beloved shows of all time, all containing insane ideas and concepts which had managed to capture children's imaginations and more importantly, the hard-earned money of those same children's parents. Always remember kids, action-adventure cartoons exist to sell toys. Of that era, the most iconic were Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Interesting fact, in the UK it was known as Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, as British censors at the time were worried it was too violent a word for the UK's impressionable youth. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, and Thundercats. All three in their day were very successful in ratings and even more so in sales of toys and other merchandise. In the early 2000s, with the intention of beginning the cycle anew, these shows were reimagined and introduced to a new generation of children whose parents had likely grown up on the originals. 2003 saw He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles both return, with narrative and stylistic changes that led to varying degrees of success. In 2011, the same was done with Thundercats. Produced by Ethan Spaulding and Michael Jelenic, and developed by Studio 4 and Warner Brothers Animation, whose parent company, Warner Brothers, had acquired the rights to Thundercats in 1989. The series was premiered with an hour-long special on Cartoon Network. Ethan Spaulding's work in animation includes working as a director, producer and storyboard artist on the animated television series, Avatar The Last Airbender. He directed 12 episodes and held various crew positions. He has directed several episodes of the brilliant Mike Tyson Mysteries, as well as directing Justice League Throne of Atlantis, and co-directing the 2014 animated film Batman Assault on Arkham, which shits on the live-action Suicide Squad. Michael Jelenic is a massive force in animation, developing and producing the entirety of Teen Titans Go!, the excellent Batman The Return of the Cape Crusader, and its sequel, Batman vs. Two-Face, as well as the popular Batman the Brave and the Bold, for which he also wrote the episode Mayhem of the Music Meister, which featured Neil Patrick Harris as the main villain. He also, along with acclaimed writer Gail Simone, wrote the screenplay for the 2009 animated Wonder Woman movie, which is actually better than the 2017 live-action version. Jelenic co-wrote the first episode, Sword of Omens, which introduces Lionel, the son of King Claudus, who is the ruler of the Kingdom of Fundera, the most powerful empire on Third Earth, a world populated by multiple races of anthropomorphic species that share similarities with the animals of our world. Lion-O is mentored by Jaga, master of the clerics, a secret society of warriors who possess incredible speed and fighting prowess, who guard Fundera and its secrets. lion impulsive tendencies as well as his intense belief in the myths of technology, something that has not been encountered for generations, causes his father tremendous frustration, as he sees this obsession as lion not taking seriously his role as the future king of Fundera, a fact that has led to a strained relationship between lion and his adopted older brother, Tigra. lion is of age to begin training with the Sword of Omens, the greatest weapon on Third Earth, and the symbol of power and leadership of the Thundercats. However, a betrayal from within the kingdom sees the return of the Thundercats' greatest enemies, the Lizards, who are armed with overwhelmingly powerful technology, which leads to the destruction of their armies and their kingdom. To Lionel and Tiger's horror, Claudus is killed by a creature revealing himself to be Mumra, a being of pure evil thought to have been a myth who is in fact behind the technology being used against Fundera and its people. Mumra wants the Sword of Omens. With it, he will achieve ultimate power and rule Third Earth. With the clerics almost wiped out by Mumra's onslaught, Jaga sacrifices himself so that the survivors can escape, entrusting the safety of lion to his protege, Chitara, the last surviving member of the Order. With Fundera fallen and the King dead, lion becomes the new Lord of the Thundercats. Angry and desperate to find a way to defeat Mumra, lion and the remaining survivors are forced to roam the lands and find aid wherever possible in order to find a way to defeat the evil sorcerer Mumra and save Third Earth. Main theme and intro. I am a child of the 1980s and 90s era of animation, a time of incredibly iconic theme tunes which to this day have had a lasting effect on myself and the rest of my generation. Thundercats is without question one of the all-time great theme tunes. Is its successor capable of matching or even surpassing such a classic piece of music? I feel 
like we've been denied something here. Story-wise, the series is much darker and more cinematic in its approach than the original show, featuring a lot more focus on characterization and sophisticated themes. The world building in Thundercats is huge in its scale, with constant hints of realms and places yet to be explored. The series takes stories and characters from all of the original lore of the 80s original, but adds its own spin. What's really impressive is how the writers manage to take the more ridiculous elements and characters and find a balance between being faithful but also making them relatable. As a result, the series is a sort of cross between Lord of the Rings and Dune, taking place in a world which is science fiction but also magical. From the point of view of the Thundercats, technology has been all but forgotten. There are still pockets of cultures which utilise it, at least in a certain fashion, which has led Third Earth to become a world of feudal societies. The show takes its time in introducing these elements, as well as bringing in additional characters. As with the original show, Lionel possesses a good heart and the potential to be a great leader, but is also young and prone to rash decisions. Chitara acts as an advisor and protector to Lionel, and the two have a somewhat flirtatious relationship. As in the original, she possesses incredible speed and is a superlative warrior. Yeah, superlative. A big change the series makes with the original source material is his relationship with Tigra. Mentioned earlier, Tigra in this version is an adopted older brother, in almost every way a rival to Lionel. Though both are devastated by the loss of their father and the kingdom, Tigra makes no secret of his belief that he would be a better king and that the Sword of Omen should be his. Further tensions between the brothers develop over their feelings for Chitara. You know, because she's so superlative. One of the standouts of the show is Panthro, who is a much angrier character in this iteration. A veteran of multiple battles and jaded by betrayal and the loss of Claudus, he often clashes with the other Thundercats on how best to proceed. Wily Kit and Wily Cat have been made far more compelling and likeable starting off as street urchins before joining Lino and his party. They are a great example of how the more mature storytelling allows for better character development. However, the best character change made is without a doubt to Snarf. Arguably 80s television's second most annoying character, after Mask's T-Bot, but still worse than He-Man's Orko. Bear in mind that comparing these characters is pretty much the same as comparing dog turds. In regards to Snarf's character in this version, in a stroke of genius the writers make him a non-talking character, making him instantly more likeable. Flashbacks are often used to reveal backstory for certain characters over the course of the series, giving the audience a better idea of some of their motivations and reasons for acting as they do. Tiger in particular receives some real focus in later episodes, taking the character in a direction which for a kid's show features genuine tragedy. Thundercats isn't afraid to go dark with its stories. Tragedy at some point affects everyone in the cast, often involving some significant loss. There are some sequences which are frankly horrific. There is humour, but the show maintains a serious tone throughout, choosing to have its humorous moments to be found in its character interactions. The quality of writing is down to the calibre of writers brought on to the series. Paul Giacopo, who has an extensive background in visual effects, which includes Rogue One, Pacific Rim, and World of Warcraft, wrote several episodes, 
as did Todd Casey, who wrote for Wonder Over Yonder, the 2012 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Future Worm. Of special note is Tad Murphy, an Academy Award nominee for his contribution to the screenplay Gorillas in the Mist, as well as being a screenwriter for the Disney animated features The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Tarzan, Atlantis, The Lost Empire, and Brother Bear. Acclaimed author J.M. DeMatteis is also a big contributor to the series, in particular with the standout episode Song of the Petalars, which packs a massive emotional punch and is a testament to the incredible collaboration of talent featured in all aspects of the show. DeMatteis is a massive deal in comics and writing in general, with previous television work including Batman the Brave and the Bold and Justice League Unlimited. Design and Style the original 1985 series was created by the late Tobin Ted Wolf, a writer and inventor with several significant patents, who came up with the idea for Thundercats with the aid of his wife and children, who had input into the characters' designs and names. Updating the look of the Thundercats was almost entirely masterminded by series art designer Dan Norton. Like the original, the new series combines elements of Western animation with Japanese anime. Dan Norton added his own spin on its character designs and vehicles, as well as the greater world building. The results are phenomenal. Every character design contains fantastic detail. All the races featured have had fought into their cultural identity, including details of their clothing and technology. Focus on character movement and how each race interacts with their environment also really adds to the show's immersion. Third Earth is a fully realized world with a mapped out geography and the attention to detail in even the smallest environment is really impressive. And this largely is due to Norton's boundless talent and obvious passion for the material. In an interview he commented on how there is no such thing as an original idea, but the important thing is the execution of these ideas and good execution can put a unique spin on an idea even if it isn't original. Thundercats is a testament to this fact. Action. With the show developed in the USA, the actual production, like its predecessor, was undertaken by a Japanese production house, acclaimed animators Studio 4, who are responsible for several award-winning productions, as well as Western collaborations including shorts featured in The Animatrix, Batman Gotham Knight, and Halo Legends. To put it simply, these guys can do action. I mean, really do action. With really inventive use of weapons and characters' physical attributes, resulting in sequences always being dynamic and interesting. Combined with Dan Norton's designs, it's just a pleasure to watch. Soundtrack. The original show boasted the already enthusiastically mentioned main theme. I could, I could play it again. That song in the series score was the work of the incredible talent that is Bernard Hoffer, who with the original Thundercat soundtrack set a standard for all animated shows that followed after it. For the new series, composer Kevin Kleisch was brought in. His work in the industry has seen him work on over 100 productions, including the role of orchestrator on films including Tangled, Frozen, Ant-Man, and the 2015 Peanuts movie. His work as composer includes scoring the entirety of Disney's Sophia the First, Tangled Ever After, and Tangled the series, as well as the DC animated movies, Superman Unbound, and Justice League War. When contacted by the producers to write the music for Thundercats, Kleisch said that the word used by the creators for what they wanted from the score was epic, and that is most certainly what the soundtrack is. The score is an incredible mix of fantasy and sci-fi, and effortlessly transitions between its action sequences and its drama, allowing some nice character moments, infusing the show with genuine heart and depth. Similar to the character and world designs, influences from Lord of the Rings and Star Wars can be heard, but this score is extremely fresh and gives the show its own identity. Voice cast. Will Friedel takes the lead as Lino, infusing him with an endearing, if somewhat immature, personality. I could list his career in more detail, but all I really need to say is that he was Terry McGuinness in Batman Beyond. Tigra is voiced by veteran voice actor Matthew Mercier. Appearing in practically every animated show in the last 10 years, he has an extensive career in English dubbed anime, as well as in computer games including Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, and even playing Luke Skywalker. He brings a tremendous amount of personality to Tigra, conveying a character that is confident and capable, but in many ways conflicted. Emmanuel Shriki, who has worked a lot in voice work, but has also had prominent roles in television and cinema, 
including HBO series Entourage, and in Adam Sandler's cult film Don't Mess With The Zohan. Shariki is excellent as Chitara, conveying a character that is powerful but also compassionate and wise. The show makes no attempts at diminishing her sexuality, but due to the quality of the writing matched by Shariki's performance, there is far more depth to the character than just her looks. She's just very superlative. Wily Kit and Wily Cat are voiced by Madeline Hall and Eamon Perisulio. They bring a tremendous likability to the roles, which could have so easily have gone the other way. Voice actor supreme himself, Kevin Michael Richardson, is Panfro. I mean, who else was it going to be? The original role was played with surprising gravitas by the late Earl Hyman. Richardson brings a more grizzled demeanour to the character, but as with all his roles, he makes Panfro compelling and easily one of the highlights of the series. Snarf, though no longer a talking character, is portrayed by Japanese actress Satomi Koryogi, who has extensive work in Japanese anime. You know, it's funny, I just assumed he was going to be voiced by Dee Bradley Baker. Supporting characters Slife and Kanar, better known as Jackalman in the original series, are portrayed by Dee Bradley Baker. There he is! Another veteran lending their talents is British actor Robin Atkin Downs, who fans of cult sci-fi series Babylon 5 will recognise as Byron Gordon. Here he brings his talents to voicing Mumra, filling the character with genuine menace in every scene he is in. Corey Burton plays Jaga, as well as various other characters on the show. A lot of high-caliber talent appears throughout the series, including the likes of Hector Elizondo, Richard Chamberlain, Mark Hamill, Jim Cummings, Pamela Adlon, and the late, great Miguel Ferrer. The legend that is Jeffrey Coombs also makes an appearance. Coombs is a massive presence in voice work, notable mentions being as The Question in Justice League Unlimited, and Ratchet in Transformers Prime. He has also played multiple iconic roles in the Star Trek universe. Michael McCain also lends his talents. McCain has a long-running career, appearing in This Is Spinal Tap and Better Call Saul, but his greatest appearance will always be in Short Circuit 2. I love Short Circuit 2. The Clancy Brown Effect. Whenever I watch any cartoon, the first thing I check is does it feature Clancy Brown? Clancy Brown is one of the greatest things to ever happen to cinema and television. His two most defining roles are as the Kurgan in Highlander and in the Bruce Tim era of DC as the voice of Lex Luthor. Still to this day, the best Lex Luthor. The man has done a lot of voice work over the years, to the point where his presence has almost been a constant in the most significant shows I watched growing up. As a result, any show not featuring him will never in my eyes be truly great. Oh, don't worry, he's in this. How meta is it? Possibly the best decision the creators made with this telling of Thundercats is the casting of Larry Kenny as King Claudus, lion father. What's brilliant about this is that Kenny was the original voice of lion -O. The man's voice is rich with power and authority, and just as distinctive as ever. It's a really nice touch, and Kenny is clearly enjoying returning to the world of the Thundercats. It's just a shame that it wasn't for longer. That's just one of the many examples of the creators paying homage to the original show. They also make a point of including a lot of the wackier ideas, the Burbles being the most obvious example, who are jarringly faithful to the 80s originals. For those of you unaware, the Burbles are robot bears that are masters of technology and have trees that produce candy. Yeah, it's really stupid, but they kind of made it work. Quite often, Easter eggs and various pop culture references are cleverly put into episodes, but not in a way that's too jarring for the audience. Initially planned for 52 episodes, Thundercats was sadly cancelled after one season. Its ratings had been solid, and it was universally praised by critics for its quality of writing and production. But as I've sadly stated in previous episodes, cartoons predominantly exist as a means to sell toys. Thundercats was very clearly not a cheap show, and sadly its continued production required toy sales to be better, which is a genuine mystery as these are great. It's a real shame as the story of these characters deserve to be told in full. Five Megaminds. Forgive the lack of an awesome theme tune. The fantastic art design, story and characters more than makes up for it. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed them, please feel free to like and subscribe and take the time to watch some of my other videos. Until next time.